if you can see my screen, we are going to uh, drop this link in the chat before the end of the day, but um, the Alzheimer's Association is hosting a free webinar on Wednesday, February 1st at 2.30 p.m. Central Time. And uh, we'd love for you all to participate if your schedule permits. It's on a Wednesday, 2.30 Central, not Eastern, but Central. I know a lot of you all tuning in are on Central Time, but we did let our partners at the Alzheimer's Association know that we would announce this and share the registration link. It's going to be a great opportunity talking about clinical trials and the need to inc include and increase uh, the representation of all groups of individuals. You know, that is part of our mission here at the Alzheimer's Association. So we did want to make you all aware of that upcoming opportunity next week. Okay. All right, we'll take a few minutes to participate in the poll if you can. Uh, we appreciate you guys again for being here with us. Again, welcome. I just wanna say uh, thanks for joining us, whether it's your first time or your 50th time. As you know, we've been hosting Brain Talk Live Going up, we're coming up on our third year anniversary, and uh, we will be dropping an announcement. There is a registration link if you plan on joining us on campus next Tuesday. We're trying to transition to uh, having more in person programs. So, Brain Talk Live next week, which will feature Dr. Eric Johnson will be next Tuesday. We're going to have it hybrid, but if you want to come and see us on site in person, we encourage you to come and we will have some nice, neat treats uh, and gifts for those who do trek, make that trek to the uh, Emory Brain Health Campus at Executive Park. We're going to be at 21 Executive Park. We're going to drop that link if you're like, okay, yeah, I enjoy Brain Talk Live. It's such great information. I really want to see everyone in person who I see on the screen. But again, Dr. Eric Johnson, our neurologist and Emory faculty, along with Dr. Monica Parker, will be our featured presenters that will be sharing information about the new drug that just received accelerated improvement. Um, accelerated approval, sorry, for uh, Lucanamab which is another um, drug that has just come online. So with that said, uh, I'm gonna do a little bit more housekeeping, turn it over to John. You know, we always begin with exercise because what's good for your heart is good for your brain. Dr. Parker is gonna come in and introduce our speaker. And then um, Ms. Deja Danzi is gonna close us out before Megan Nair comes on to talk about our cognitive empowerment program. So, you know, we cover a lot of information all in under 60 minutes. So I'm going to encourage you right now to go grab pen and paper. If you've been here with us, you know, the content is great. You're going to have lots of nuggets to take away with you. But with that said, thank you already. I see we have 120 plus people on already. Thank you to the 218 people that joined us last week. That recording is going to be made available soon. It was an informative session. You guys had so many questions for Dr. Parker, just about dementia and memory loss and signs and symptoms and medication. So I encourage you, once you get that notification bell that the link is live from last week's recording, go and watch it again. The, there were so many uh, awesome tips in there that you can benefit from. So with that said, thank you for joining us. We appreciate you for being here. You can be anywhere else on a Tuesday, but again, you made the decision to tune in and stop by and share with us today for Brain Talk Live. So I'm gonna turn it over to John. Remember you all have to go at your own pace. John goes fast, he goes slow, but he is gonna get you moving. His enthusiasm is gonna come through the screen. So with that said, John, come on in. He's gonna work us out for about eight, maybe 10 minutes. And then the next voice you should hear will be Dr. Monica Parker. Thanks everyone. Hey, hey, hey! First of all, I would like to thank you, thank you, thank you for coming on. And all of you that I see on that uh, around Atlanta, and y'all approach me and say, I saw you on Instagram Live. Thank you, thank you to see your faces live. 
Okay, if you have canned goods, water bottles, or you just want to use your upper body, let's get ready to go. I'm going to use my canned goods. Thank you. 
Thank you. I'm John Lewis, and see you later. Bye. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you, John. Um, in any event, we'll move on. We start off all of our weekly Brain Talk Live uh, programs with John Lewis getting us revved up and exercised. So that being said, our next presenter is Dr. Yasmin Romani who is from Albert Einstein College in New York. And her area of interest is talking about how diet and activity, different types of diet are important for reducing cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease risk. So the exercise you do, the food you eat, all of this stuff works to affect our brain. So Dr. Romani is new to us, but the important thing that you need to know is she's another National Institutes of Health, National Institutes of Aging funded researcher. This means that the research that she is doing in New York is research that's going to eventually affect all of us. And it is funded by our federal government. So we need to see what doctors and researchers around the world are learning about. Thank you, Dr. Romani, for joining us, and we're excited to have you with us today. This is a group that likes exercise, that likes to learn how to be healthy. So, Dr. Romani. Uh, Dr. Parker, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here and talk to you about one of my favorite topics, which is nutrition. I was trained as a nutrition scientist. I've worked in lifestyle, uh, the area of lifestyle, but in this particular talk, I'll be talking to you about a, um, a uh, intervention that we're doing to test whether a diet that's high in fruits and vegetables and grains um, and low in processed foods can reduce cognitive de decline and Alzheimer's disease risk. So I'm going to share my slides. Um, I'm going to make sure I can do this. Uh, here we go. Um, okay, so, so actually I'm disabled 
for screen sharing. Um, okay, she'll, well, Ms. Dejan, we'll get it straight for you. Um, okay. <laughs> I think it's important for everybody to know, Dr. Romani, that you're in New York and your climate is a little different from ours, but yes. you also work with a number of different types of populations, different yes. ethnic groups. And in New York, you probably have a whole lot more people to work with than we do. Right now, we're up to over 200 people. Thank okay, you. So can you see my screen now? I think... Yes, ma'am. It works now. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much again for having me. Um, so I work in the Department of Health Behavior Research and Implement Implementation Science. I always have a hard time with all the words. Um, in the Department of Epidemiology at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. And my study is, uh, is done at in the Bronx. So uh, before we begin, um, what do you think is least likely to help prevent memory decline? So being physically active, uh, keeping blood sugar levels under control, avoiding gluten, eating colorful fruits and vegetables, or controlling blood pressure. So as you probably know, uh, with the wonderful um, exercise regimen you had, being physically active is really important. So that's that's not the answer. Keeping blood sugar levels under control is also very important uh, because it allows um, uh, you to keep um, the, 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 you, you to not get diabetes and other uh, and obesity and other illnesses that might impact Alzheimer's disease. Um, so I'm going to skip over C. Um, eating fruits and vegetables are really important, particularly colorful fruits and vegetables. I'll go into a lot of detail uh, in this call uh, today and also controlling blood pressure. So avoiding gluten is not going to help you prevent memory decline. So the answer is number C. Um, so that's, um, so it sounds like you all, a lot of you got that answer. So I'm going to move on to the next. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you, uh, giving you an overview of the burden of dementia and Alzheimer's disease in the U.S. Um, why nutrition? What's the evidence from animal studies and epidemiological and clinical trials in humans? What's the evidence from dietary patterns, nutrients, and foods? And what is the role of inflammation um, and um, other aspects that increase inflammation in the body. So inflammation is what when the body is fighting bacteria, disease, um, and sometimes it overfights and you need um, nutrients and uh, compounds to reduce inflammation. And uh, we think one of the uh, things that drive Alzheimer's disease is too much inflammation. So uh, what have we done so far? There have been several clinical trials that have tested different dietary patterns. Uh, there's one big one called the FINGERS trial, which is worldwide, and also the trial that I'll be talking to you to about that we're doing currently in the Bronx, uh, which is the Multicultural Healthy Dietary Pattern to Reduce Cognitive Decline and Alzheimer's Disease Risk. So Alzheimer's disease is the sixth leading cause of death um, in the US. And in 2021, the direct costs for caring for individuals with Alzheimer's disease um, is, was over $355 billion. Um, and they're, so they're going to increase, this is estimated, it could be even more, to $1.1 trillion. That's in today's dollars by 2050, so in about 30 years from now. So that's a huge cost for the nation. Um, uh, and today, 6.2 million Americans 65 years and older live with Alzheimer's disease. And in about 30 years, we'll have twice as many people. And particularly, um, Black and Hispanic adults are particularly at risk. And one in 10 people aged 60 and 65 and over, so that's 10%, um, has Alzheimer's dementia. So if you're in a room with 65-year-olds uh, and there are 10 of you in the room, one could have potentially Alzheimer's disease. And this is a great source if you're interested. Um, this is the Alzheimer's um, organization website if you're interested in more facts and figures. So what is the evidence base for the importance of diet and reducing cognitive decline? Um, so when we feed rats a diet high in fat and sh uh, sucrose or sugar, um, as a model of the Western diet, um, the animals don't do so well in terms of learning and behavior and their impairments and how the neurons talk to each other. So they can't talk to each other well. So when they can't talk to each other, then uh, there are memory issues and uh, memory decline sets in. 
Uh, so then other than animal studies, we have um, the epidemiological studies. So these are studies where you look at large numbers of people instead of animals. And um, here we see association. So it's a lot of times it's very hard to um, look at the uh, causation to see, you know, this causes that. Um, but so we, a lot all, all the time, a lot of times we just start with looking at associations. So when we look at uh, people's brains, we'll see that um, lower intakes of nutrient-dense foods and higher intakes of unhealthy foods um, are associated with a small, smaller hippocampal volume. So why is the hippocampus important? So that's the uh, hippocampus, by the way, in Greek uh, means seahorse. Uh, it's that part, um, it's in your brain. Um, and that's where short-term memories become long-term. So it's very important to keep the hippocampus um, as young as possible, so it doesn't deteriorate. And so it's possible that foods may have um, um, may have more um, ability to reduce this decline. Um, the other um, thing to look at that we've looked at is anti-inflammatory uh, dietary patterns, uh, the Mediterranean diet, and uh, what you may know about the MIND diet, which is the Mediterranean diet plus a diet that reduces hypertension. It's called the DASH diet, the dietary approaches for stopping hypertension. And there's also another pattern that's been tested in Finland and Norway called the Nordic diet. So these diets seem to have some impact on reducing cognitive decline. Um, well, the other thing we noticed is that uh, individuals who eat more uh, vitamin A, so carotenoids, um, lutein being the most prominent, and that's associated with vision, um, highly available in avocado and green leafy vegetables. Um, these nutrients, vitamin D and um, fatty acids from fish, are also um, associated with uh, a reduction in cognitive decline. So to summarize, uh, the food, the specific foods would be broccoli, spinach, kale, say kiwi, grapes, oranges, zucchini, and squash, and foods high in folate or green leafy um, uh, vegetables, uh, avocados, eggs, fruits, and uh, vitamin D is a lot in the vitamin D fortified products, as well as sardines and fish. Um, so that's kind of a summary of what we see in um, and all these um, different aspects. There's also um, the, uh, so here I'm gonna be talking about the Nordic diet that I mentioned earlier. Again, this was tested in Finland um, and, and Norway. And um, it, it, as you see, the base of the food is berries and strawberries. And uh, you'll see Brussels sprouts and uh, cauliflower, broccoli. And on top of the base are things like sweets uh, and cookies. So you want to have more of the fruits, vegetables, and berries in particular. Um, the skin of the berries, uh, there, there's a, a compound called resveratrol that you find that in grapes, in um, mulberries, and strawberries. And there's something about uh, that particular compound keeping the neurons younger uh, and able to communicate with each other better. Um, in the middle of the pyramid, you'll see the whole grains um, and the, the milk and the oils are higher up on, on the top. So there was a, a, a trial done um, in Finland where they did test the Nordic diet, which I just showed you, the whole grain cereal products, low fat milk and meat products, a lot of fruits and vegetables. Um, and they kept the sugar intake to less than 10 teaspoons a day, which so one can of soda has about um, nine and a half teaspoons. So, so for, from all the sugars that you eat all day, it has to be less than 10 teaspoons. So you, if you have a can of soda, you can't have sugar from anything else, a cookie, or um, if you had yogurt that had added sugar. Uh, so it, it was restricted to less than 50 grams a day. And, in, and instead of butter, the suggestion was rapeseed oil, um, vegetable margin, uh, or olive oil, or whatever oils except like canola oil that are um, higher in polyunsaturated or monounsaturated fats, and fish portions, at least two portions a week. And um, this was done on uh, at-risk adults. So these were um, uh, people who were inactive, uh, they had depression, they were overweight and obese, and they had type 2 diabetes. And after two years, when they put them on this diet, 
they looked at the, they did some testing on their cognitive function and the, the participants who were in the group that made the changes to their diet uh, did better in terms of their um, testing uh, than the, the group that was, that didn't change their diet. So, um, so there's, there's something there about changing your diet and um, improving cognition. So these are uh, studies that are ongoing in different parts of the world, um, in Singapore and five sites in the US and also in, in Australia. Um, and these are, you know, generally these studies have been targeting at-risk people or 50 to 75 years of age. So people who may, you know, are starting to, to even get Alzheimer's or mild, the, the earlier versions was just a mild cognitive impairment. So what um, we decided to do in our study was to, to see maybe if we, um, make changes earlier instead of making changes in our diet when we're 60, 65, or 70, or closer, well, more, close to like 70, 70, closer to uh, when we might get memory decline. Uh, and what would it be like if we did the changes earlier on? So we, so we decided to um, recruit 40 to 65 year old uh, diverse Bronx uh, co op city um, healthy adults. And um, uh, do a, a, a diet trial with the same type of foods. But we didn't, you know, and but using the foods that people are uh, are used to. So, in other words, if they don't like um, olive oil, they could try a different oil as long as it was healthy, canola oil or some other oil. Um, and uh, look at anti-inflammatory compounds. So, if you're used to using um, certain spices, if it was basil, continue. You know, Italian cooking use basil. If it was curry, continue using curry. But cut out the fried foods, cut out the sugar, cut out the um, pastries and processed foods, and just focus on healthier eating, uh, eating foods that are healthier that you are accustomed to, but just do a makeover of your food. So uh, we tried to map it to um, a person's cultural background. So we decided to do it in the Bronx. Um, you may know Bronx is a very diverse community. And we first focused on co-op city, which is um, the largest cooperative um, in the United States, about 50 to 60,000 people live there. Um, and so I'll do more details on that. Um, so what, what motivated us to do the study was that we noticed again that the um, this MIND diet, these anti-inflammatory diets were all associated um, with reduced incidence of Alzheimer's. Again, this was a Euro-American cohort in Chicago. Uh, it was a French cohort. Um, and then the Women's Health Initiative has a more diverse cohorts. Uh, again, we saw differences um, in uh, dementia, uh, kind of less of that um, when people were on these healthier diets. And you can see all the references. And we also uh, found th that there's a dietary inflammatory index. So what this index does is it takes all the foods that you eat and gives it a grade based on a level of inflammatory potential. So for example, green tea is a really nice anti-inflammatory food. So our spices like garlic and ginger in particular and cloves and oregano and um, uh, turmeric. So um, we decided to uh, kind of encourage uh, our participants to and add these foods if they, you know, if they were interested, pick and choose what they like, but to really focus on anti-inflammatory foods. And so um, we were able to recruit, now this is during the pandemic, uh, we started in um, late 2018, and we now have 290 participants, 40 to 65 years of age, who are participating in our study. Um, they represent the diversity of the Bronx, as you see, it's quite diverse um, from all different backgrounds and primarily from co-op city and surrounding areas. This is a picture uh, of co-op city. Um, as you see, there are a lot of uh, towers and it's extremely um, urban uh, with some greenery in between. Um, and uh, we first start target uh, recruited participants from Co-op City, and then we went to the neighboring um, uh, surrounding areas. Co-op City uh, participants are extremely civic minded. Um, I, and I started uh, my work in 1992 in the Women's Health Initiative. I don't know if you know about that study. That was a huge study done around the country. We had 
uh, um, uh, 40 sites around the country. And we had many participants from Co-op City. And many are still in that study. So they've been in the study over 30 years. And we're having our 30th anniversary now. So um, a very civic-minded community, very interested in participating and have contributed enormously to advancing science. Um, so this is the... Um, Leaflet that we passed around that you know if you're interested in um, in being participating, we have classes at, on site. So before the pandemic, we had our our classes on site. So you you were, you were either invited, randomly selected to be in the group that made changes to the diet, or uh, we had aging uh, topics, safety topics. We happened to pick topics like vaccinations, and we had no idea that we were going to have a pandemic. So it was just amazing that um, our topic was timely because about year and a half into recruitment, we had had the pandemic hit. So we had to move all our classes online. We could no longer have classes in the library in Co-op City on site and all our um, outreach, which was in person and going to health fairs and shaking people's hands turned um, all into um, kind of remote, a lot of, a lot of Zoom uh, work that we did um, in this study. So here's a um, kind of a, an overview of the activities. Um, uh, they, they come to the screening. Uh, they're followed up about uh, three times. So at month nine, 18, and 27, they play brain games. So they change their diet. They record what they eat seven days every nine months. And they also play these brain games. So here's a, 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 um, an example of a brain, brain game. So they have, they see these pictures. Do you see the picture on the right where um, it says, which of these matches a pair above? So they would have to match um, uh, the, the pair, say, on the left side, or the upper left or the lower left, say, would be the match. So they have to pick on these, and they have these brain games on a smartphone. So they all get a smartphone, and um, they play these brain games, which looks at processing speed, how well you, uh, how well you process uh, these pictures and respond to prompts. Um, and we also have questions about, you know, what's your thinking right now? Are you thinking, um, uh, is your thinking slow? Is it fast? Did you, were you physically active? So we assess um, how physically active they were. And um, we have wait time, uh, we have these beeps uh, four times a day that they respond to and they play their brain games at that time. So they're randomized to the diet or to the uh, sessions on safety topics that I mentioned. Um, and this is the diet that we emphasize fruits and vegetables and fish and um, the, the spices above, you'll see a photo of the curry plant um, and also ginger in the bottom um, to kind of give you an idea. So kind of emphasize that. And this could be like your weekly shopping list, making sure you have whole grains at home, um, broccoli or whatever vegetable you prefer. Um, if you, and a lot of beans, uh, so it could be black eyed uh, peas or it could be uh, pigeon peas, uh, which are high in protein. Um, uh, it could be other beans, but uh, it, it, so it's moving from eating a lot of um, processed meats to beans and fish um, or just, um, just lean meats in general. And um, also limiting, as you see, you can still have the pumpkin pie or sweet potato pie, but you would limit it to once a week. You could still have ice cream, but just limiting it. And using that score that I mentioned to you earlier, uh, we're able to score the diets and, to, um, and show how, um, whether they're highly anti-inflammatory or not. So this particular diet um, was scored as being highly anti-inflammatory. So I'm gonna move on. So this is like what we had like a hit list, like what foods um, participants should uh, kind of target and make sure they're not having it and not having too much of it. So that's limiting red meats, butter, stick margarine. Again, anything that um, helps the heart helps the brain. So if uh, butter, butter um, is um, accumulating in the artery, it's this plaque or whatever, it's or cheese, whatever, it's best to move on to um uh, fats that are liquid at room temperature, like olive oil or canola oil. 
And in terms of um, foods to embrace, it's again, the anti-inflammatory foods that I mentioned earlier, broccoli, uh, cantaloupes, green leafies in particular are great for vision and also for the brain, um, whichever type you like. Um, and then the other thing you're really emphasize is hydration. 75% um, of your brain is made of water. So when you wake up, uh, it's, it's great if you drink a glass of water to replace what you lose when you're sleeping. And it also helps with your cognition, um, your thinking ability. Um, so in adding all kinds of uh, seasonings and herbs, when we had the classes in person, we actually would bring all these herbs and um, seasonings and people would take some home and try them. Now we do a lot of that online. Um, we also uh, focus on getting to like how to do sh um, shopping so that um, you're savvy about the nutrition facts labels, making sure how you read the nutrition facts labels, and also um, adapting your cooking techniques to add spices and herbs. And and then um, as the participants move through these group classes, we have monthly calls. Um, so we have. Uh, several calls to month 18 so that's so that's like an 18 month um, intervention that they're on so the monthly calls are, are we have a wonderful health coach and she calls the participants and talks to them 20 minutes or whatever time they have to see you know how are they doing you know what uh, what issues are they having are they having problems with um you know, their grandkids coming in and bringing in the ice cream? Do they have problems with, um, you know, getting fruits and vegetables, particularly during the pandemic? Um, and so she'll make suggestions and, um, and talk about um, and also how to, uh, and so if she was talking to the group that wasn't making any changes, she would just mainly focus on how to buy foods economically. So she won't talk about uh, the changing the diet because we wanted we want to see the difference between um, what happens when people change their diet versus uh, that they stay the same to see whether it really makes a difference. And then we have the different ways of assessing whether the participants have made changes. They write down what they're eating, so it's a bit of a burden because they have to write down seven days every nine months. But they've been very willing to do. Um, uh, they're very interested in the study and they're uh, very willing to do the work. Um, we have a website, um, it's called ASA24, if any one of you is interested, you can uh, track your, um, uh, what you're eating, your, your food, food um, foods that you're eating using that website is free. Um, it's, it was developed by the National Cancer Institute and yeah. they monitor mm -hmm. what they're eating on their website. Dr. Romani, would you yes. repeat that website again? And maybe yes. Oh, yes, I should. Um, yes, it's called, if you Google ASA24, ASA-24, um, it's from the National Cancer Institute. Um, and I can, um, I can go to that at the end of the talk. I can show you that, that particular website. Um, okay, that would be helpful. We're getting a lot of questions about, about that. About that, yeah. 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 Oh, okay, so that's a great website, um, and it's free. And we not only do researchers use it, but you can use it um, as a consumer, and um, you can track your diet. Um, and it has wonderful um, food portion sizes, so you can like it'll ask you, are you having a cup of milk or two cups of milk, or, or if you're having, <laughs> excuse me, a cup of rice or three cups of rice. They have pictures of rice, so make sure that they're getting um, the numbers accurately. So that's a that's so that's what they're doing. When, I, when we talk about self monitoring, that's what they do. So they, um, so they actually in the study they're self monitoring um, what, whatever way they want because there are other websites to um, that they use. Um, but there's fitnesspal.com is another one. But um, for our study, they have to use the ASA um, 24. So this is a typical day. Um, uh, so again, they can just change it to what if they don't like cauliflower or rice or whatever <clears throat> they don't have to um they don't have to they just eat whatever they're interested in hmm. excuse me so a breakfast could be a whole cup of grain cereal with berries bananas or if it's not fresh berries they can have frozen berries if you buy fresh berries and they're going bad you can put it in the microwave and um put it in the fridge for, it'll last longer um, you can put your old bananas in the freezer and have them later. So you can, you know, you can also buy um, like a lot of frozen blueberries uh, and just put it in the freezer. So there are different ways of 
uh, accessing um, the fruits and vegetables in the study. Um, so that could be the breakfast and for snack, they might have uh, nuts or almonds or mangoes or milk beverages made without sugar uh, with banana. So for lunch, it could be, again, with fo focuses on whole wheat. So if you have to read the nutrition facts label, make sure the word, word whole wheat is there and um, uh, you know, low fat mozzarella or whatever, chicken and avocados. Uh, again, the idea is everything's baked and um, avocados are wonderful um, uh, item to include. And you see for dinner, it could be um, the fish, the catfish or chicken or baked pork chops. Um, again, whatever um, you, you know, you're interested in eating or you could have a vegetarian alternative. Um, again, the idea is portion control, variety, um, coloring your plate. So make sure you get all the colors of the fruits and vegetables. Um, and, and the idea is not to um, uh, make you not have any foods that you really like. You can have your dessert once in a while, but not to have it um, every day. And again, also the idea, um, and that we talk a lot about it, is not to put all of the heavy meal at the end of the day. It's try to spread it out during the day. Um, because we find more and more that if you're having a heavy meal, when you come home, you're tired from work, you, you may end up eating too much and um, it, it puts kind of pressure on your body. It's better to space out what you eat, eat um, more earlier in the day. It's just overall healthier for you. Uh, there are now more and more, more studies looking at the timing of food. And again, the earlier, the, the better. So uh, it's best to eat um about three hours before you go to sleep. So if you're going to sleep at 10, then just try to finish eating by 7 p.m. So let me, okay, so that's the, okay. So here's just another example of the brain games that participants play in our study. Um, so in the one on the left, like they'll see all these dots and they're asked to remember where they are. They get a distraction. So this is again on the smartphone. And then they have to, um, uh, indicate where the dots were. So this is kind of a, a way to test short-term memory. So then the symbol comparison is to test how fast you, uh, it's called processing speed. And then the three uh, figures on the right, um, they look at short-term memory. Like you have to match the form of that particular shape and the color uh, when you see it again, to see whether are they same or the, are they different? So these are the kinds of brain games they play. And uh, we also asked them, you know, how they slept last night. Sleep is really important. Did they feel refreshed? Um, did they have anything to eat? So not only are they recording on their smartphone, but also on that ASA 24. Um, so, the, but they'll just put a few items there um, uh, in, in their smartphones about what they ate. So we might be able to tie, for example, if they had donuts, for example, in the morning, did they do um, worse or better than somebody having just oatmeal in the morning uh, on their testing? So this is um, what we're testing. We're looking at, we're comparing the two groups, the group that may change the diet versus the group that just took the, the, the courses on safety issues and vaccinations. And, you know, it, believe it or not, they find, find that uh, those courses interesting. They come to the sessions uh, and they find it helpful. And particularly in the pandemic, uh, we found that participants really liked being on a Zoom, um, you know, even though they preferred in person, it was a, a kind of a way to be together and not be lonely. And, you know, it was a time where, you know, we were all didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, and so they exchanged ideas with each other. And, um, and, and so they kind of, they like the contacts. So we're looking at the difference between the two groups to see whether um, the diet can help um, processing speed, memory, and, um, uh, these games that detect early Alzheimer's disease. We're also looking at whether uh, the diet um, had any any specific things uh, re related to the diet and all these other aspects of memory, um, such as a short-term binding memory processing speed and these different tasks that are related to memory. Um, so just- Bonnie, if I can interrupt you for just a minute, Yes. Um, thank you for the reference for ASA 24. And for yes. everybody listening, it is in the chat. This is the list of foods that are preferred, and we can incorporate some of those. So I'm trying to answer some of the questions. But 
there's a couple of questions I do want to bring your attention to. People have asked, well, what about the sugar that's in fresh fruit? Are you counting that? Is that a bad thing? Is that important to note? And then the other thing is alcohol. Okay. Okay. Those are really good questions. So we, um, we talk more about um, added sugars. Uh, if you are, um, so added sugars, that's, that's what's added to the food. Like if you have yogurt and the sugar is added, if the fruit itself has intrinsic um, sh sugars, you know, if it's very high in sugar, for example, mangoes are somewhat high in sugar. And if you're diabetic, whatever, you may be advised to just eat it, like limit the amount. But when I'm talking about the 10 grams, it's really the added sugars that we're talking about. Um, um, but, but again, um, the emphasis is on um, moving away from added sugars, having fruits and vegetables um, and staying and, and limiting the, you know, the fruits that may be extremely high in sugar. So um, that's a really good question. In terms of alcohol, um, um, alcohol in terms of cognitive, uh, cognitive issues, there's, there's some evidence that, you know, it might have adverse, um, impact. So, um, we don't emphasize, um, emphasize it in our study. We don't like encourage having, um, uh, alcohol or, um, um, in, in our study, but there's a lot that needs to be done in that area. Um, uh, I'm sorry, was there another question? sugar substitute so a lot of us okay. kind of have a little trouble with sugar so okay, okay. so i can tell you about sugar substitutes okay so i did some work um, on that particular topic um uh, i was interested in artificial sweetened beverage consumption and in the women's health initiative which was a large group of women uh, you know over a hundred thousand and we saw associations with um excessive consumption so that's two or more servings of artificially sweetened beverage um, per day and increased risk, excess risks for stroke and heart disease and shortened lifespan. So what this means is, again, when you're having two or three a day, that's maybe not a good idea of artificially sweetened beverages. And at that time, it was aspartame and um, uh, so, and it wasn't these newer ones uh, that, that were used in the artificially sweetened uh, beverage um, study that I looked at. So um, if, if you can, if you, um, if you, not, if you need something sweet, um, may, maybe you may want to cut down slowly. Um, um, if you want to use artificially sweetened uh, sweeteners, then I, I would, I would hesitate, um, particularly if you're using the older ones like aspartame. Um, there's some new evidence that you know they may affect your gut microbiome. We don't really have all the data yet, but if you can, um, like move to say if it was if it's for beverages like maybe water and um, you can have sparkling water or water with um, some sort of a lemon essence or some. Um, naturally kind of flavoring that you could add it's what about honey, or maple syrup? honey or maple syrup or anything but just a little bit um, um or just just have fewer of the artificial sweetened beverage drinks if you can some people get addicted to those too so it's you know it's a very important question like how much is enough how much can you have which of the artificial sweeteners are safer than others and i don't think we have all the answers to that yet i can just tell you all, based on our study and that was published in 2019 uh, in the journal stroke we did see these adverse um, associations again it's an association so unfortunately when we do these studies we see associations to really say okay this causes that um, it, it requires a lot of like investment and lengthy like trials where people record what they eat every year like say for 20 years um, and then we look at um, their stroke risk in, in a lot of these studies the diet is maybe assessed in year one or year three it's just too expensive to do it like on a hundred thousand women like to assess every single year and then to see okay it really is the sugar sweet beverages that's doing that or is something else but there's now been a, enough evidence to suggest that um we need really need to be cautious and maybe you know something else water tea even um may be better than these sweet artificial sweetened beverages so so going back to um the um uh, the Alzheimer's disease, um, again, uh, looking at different, not just diet, but also 
uh, physical activity and all these other ways, um, get, making sure you get enough sleep. Um, these are other ways to make sure uh, to, to, to keep your brain uh, functioning at its best, to keep that, what I mentioned earlier, the hippocampus, the seahorse, that part of your brain, to keep it as intact as possible. People who learn a lot of languages when they're young or whatever, they can um, keep some of that, um, you know, keep that hippocampus kind of maybe intact longer, but in the end, it's how we live and how we sleep and uh, kind of reducing stress and doing all these things that um, help us preserve our cognition. So I'm going to conclude by thanking um, the National Institutes on Aging for um, interest in our study and for funding it. Um, uh, for the last five years. Uh, we, we're still working on finishing the study. Um, we were hit by the pandemic, so we had to slow down a bit. Um, and we uh, extreme gratitude to our dedicated participants who continue to contribute to this important study and have pers persevered despite the pandemic. And as well, our staff, um, you know, work through the pandemic. And these are our co-investigators. So I'm going to um, stop here. Um, and um, the ASA 24, would you like me to show you that website or, or do, would you like me to answer more questions? I think we want you to answer more questions. There's okay. a whole bunch in there. It's like, oh, what yeah. about sugars? And you've addressed it. And I've tried to address it from the standpoint of if you're eating something that's naturally sweet, that's better for you than eating like a gummy bear. You want a peach, eat a peach, but not a gummy bear peach. Okay. Or a lifesaver peach. Okay. You want to have, um, you know, something that's unprocessed. I see all kinds of things that are in there. The idea is that you eat something that is not processed, something you didn't go to the store to buy that's in a package. Okay. Now there is another question in here. Um, and thank you, Dr. Romani. This has been very, very insightful, very, very helpful to us. Um, people are gonna be able to pick up this chat again in our YouTube channel. But if you're continuing this study, we live in Georgia, is there any way that we can help you with this study? Because this seems to be what they like. Well, I would love to have you all participate. I mean, right now, um, when we're thinking of a next phase for our study, if we decide to uh, expand, we will certainly uh, you know, keep you in mind. We actually are you know, in a phase right now where um, we would like to continue with the participants who are in the study for a longer period of time to see whether the diet has long-term effects, um, is it really helping, and also um, perhaps enrolling new participants. So there might be an opportunity. I'll certainly keep you uh, in mind. And, We'd like to be um, your southern arm, oh, just saying. Oh, we would love to. Oh, we would love to have you. And then, um, of course, we have to get funding uh, to do this, but to, to see whether this really works uh, not just in the Bronx for, for first we have to see if it works because we're still collecting data we can't um, analyze all the data until the last person finishes the study because we don't want to bias what they might do so um, we would um, we would like to you know uh, once we get the data of course it'll be all out but we do have one publication and it, it was in the slide like in some of the pictures you might have seen a publication that, that describes you know what we're doing in this study and um, how we're using smartphones to get like real life um, uh, brain in, like information about how what your cognitive status is because when you go to the doctor and you're in a clinic you might not be um, you might be nervous or whatever it might not be in a natural setting so when you when they test your cognitive function and you you know you might do might be different when you're at home or you're, you're in office and the same with the diet it's all assessed um, in real time so we can we can connect the real time food data with the brain game data. So that was the whole idea. Okay, thank you. There again, it uh, says which brain game website. And I think we put okay. the fitness one up there, but is there is a brain game. Brain game website. Website. Uh, um, okay, so the brain games are developed by Penn State. Um, uh, I don't know if they have a website. Um, it, it may, uh, if, I, if, they, if I can come up with one, I'll let you know um, of the brain game website. Um, but these were developed, these are actually, I can actually tell you, um, these were the prototype and it's now, it's called the MT, M2C2 and it's the um, National Institute of Health actually is using the, our prototype. So it was developed by Dr. Slowinski who was in the um, acknowledgement sheet. And so it's called the M2C2. Um, uh, 
M2C2, and it's the uh, NIH toolbox. NIH toolbox is a toolbox of brain games, and this is the mobile version of the toolbox. So this tests like your memory, like your spatial memory, you know, those dots that you saw, like where are the dots, and then they give you a distractor, and then where are they now? Okay, so I'm gonna turn it over. Thank you so much, Dr. Romani. If you can answer you. some of the questions in the chat. Megan, I think is on trying to advertise for our cognitive empowerment program, which comes on immediately following this. This has been truly a wonderful seminar, Dr. Romani. Thank, Thank you so much for joining us. So answer some of the questions, I think, uh, Megan. Thank you, Dr. Romani. Thank you, Dr. Parker. Yeah, I'm just sitting here setting up in our physical activity center um, for Tai Chi today. If you have not joined us before, CEP Live is a weekly webinar that is a separate webinar hosted by the Cognitive Empowerment Program at Emory. And I just dropped the link into the chat. It's a separate link where we host weekly education sessions on how to really empower your brain health. And one of the ways we know to do that is through physical fitness. Last week, we had Mark from our physical fitness team. And this week, we have Tina coming in to teach about 45 minutes of Tai Chi. Uh, one of the things we know from research is that Tai Chi and brain health are things that are really correlated to be successful for lowering stress and helping with these cognitive connections. So if you would like to join us for the next hour of programming on a separate link, I've put that information and that uh, registration address right there into the chat. We'll put it in there one more time, but we'd love to have you all uh, join us for the next session. So thank you so much, Dr. Parker. Thank you, Dr. Romani. And hopefully we'll see some of you on the link that I just dropped into the chat there. All right, well, y'all have that link in the chat. If you have not registered already, I highly recommend that you do so. Thank you once again, Dr. Romani, for all of the information that you've given us. You have a lot of feedback in the chat telling you that thank you. Um, and once again, these slides and the presentation will be made available via our website and our YouTube channel. And with that said, we will conclude for today. I'm gonna drop the link one more time for our in-person event on next Tuesday. So if you wanna hear from Dr. Eric Johnson next week, make sure you sign up via the link that I'm about to drop. Anything else, Dr. Parker? No, thank you. See you again next week. Hope to see you every week. Thank you. Thank, thank you all you. for joining us.